Uh, let's see, I'm going to try switching input. Uh, no, no, I, I he still gets to the middle though. <laughs> and then uh, I, I was chuck I was chuckling at the the gift. I'm going to type in every word I know. Uh, I can put that in. <laughs> Any Broadway shows in New York? No, we didn't have time for that, but it was. I, 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 I do too. <laughs> Check that out. We are sent. Uh, right. so, <laughs> I did, I did. It's a good one. <laughs> With me here, I'm just um, setting up, making sure that yeah, this should be good. I think we're all good, right? We're all good. Somebody's watching us. Um, yeah. And now, Oh my gosh, I don't know if we're actually going to write this whole thing out. Um, although it's important. Networks, I'm going to read it. Net or denoising Monte Carlo I better not abbreviate that Carlo rendering bang with an exclamation point okay let's close this computers are noisy Let's arrange this so it's at least kind of. And I'll try to write big. And let's see, uh, how's this? That's not bad. Let's zoom in a little bit. That's what I'm talking about. Zoom in. No going down, though. Uh, that'll work. All right, welcome to Talk 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 Training. We're going to do a rendering one with a little bit of. Machine learning, which is good, because it has to be machine learning to be good. And today we're going to be talking about a, a paper from SIGGRAPH 2017. And this is, this is fun. First of all, I'm not the author of this paper. This paper is going to be shown at SIGGRAPH this year in about a month. And so what I like to do, especially with Chalk Talks, you know, as these papers start becoming available on the web, and there are a lot available on the web, I'm sort of cherry picking the ones that seem interesting to me, mostly to try to figure them out, right? So the idea here is that you can watch this and then go to the paper and actually listen to the person who knows about this stuff and ask them at least a little bit better questions. Because <laughs> I am probably going to tell you wrong things. But the author out there will be, you know, then you go to the author and you go, oh, this is where Doug got things wrong. But hopefully we'll get, we'll, we'll at least have a neat little in introduction on this kind of stuff. Um, and we have an hour where the author of the paper is only going to have 18 minutes, and there's a lot of stuff in this paper. So what's the problem that these guys are trying to solve? And I'm actually going to get a chair, and I'm going to do a screen share. Let's see if I can actually do this. Um, in case you guys didn't look at it, we're going to, uh, there we go, share this, and then I'm going to share the input with the, all right, 
So hopefully people on Life Science can see the paper and people on uh, YouTube can see the paper and, and you guys can see the paper by doing this. Hold on. Yeah. It's all coming together. I'm getting to be expert at this. Um, okay. So I guess I can hide this. No, I don't want to hide that. I want to be able to shut, stop sharing. So what do we have here? Let's go look at some of these images. Um, so starting off at the top of this paper, there is a typical image that's produced by a Monte Carlo rendering um, where the Monte Carlo, remember what a Monte Carlo renderer is. It's this renderer that basically is shooting off rays, random rays. Monte Carlo means, hey, we're going to just be choosing random rays that we're going to shoot into the scene. And they're not really random, right? They're, they're, hopefully these are sort of guided rays that are, are doing things. But we want, in a true Monte Carlo session, or a, a simulation, you're sending out all these rays, basically trying to sample the world. And as you shoot out more and more and more rays, you're figuring out how light is transporting around the scene. And eventually, as all of these rays get you know, uh, sucked back into the pixels, they converge on the right answer. So in a true unbiased renderer, as you shoot out more rays, your, your image is going to get better and better and better because you're going to be converging on the sort of expected value of each pixel based on this noise. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So what you see on the left, and, and you can see this, SPP is samples per pixel. On the left, you have what an unbiased Monte Carlo renderer will do if all you're doing is shooting out 32 samples per pixel. And you can definitely tell that it looks like the image, but it's, it's got noise like crazy because you haven't converged on the expected values of these pixels yet. You haven't done enough so that you can get the actual results. You have these, this enormously noisy image. So the top part of the image on the left, and the top right part of the image on the left, has a 1,024 samples per pixel. And you can tell that the image is much, it's converged, it's really gotten really sharp. It's uh, gotten a lot better. And you can imagine that, especially depending on the kinds of things that are in your image, if you've got sharp point lights or you've got a lot of different light sources, you need a lot, a lot of samples in order to capture all this light transport that's going on in the image. So 32 samples per, um, per pixel is something that you can do really quickly. But as you start getting up into thousands of samples per pixel, which you might need in order to get convergence, it's starting to take a while, right? This is actually, nah, this is crazy time. Because remember, when you're sampling out there, you're doing all sorts of geometry stuff. There's all sorts of you know, renderers nowadays are super complicated in terms of how they manage all this data. But still, it takes a long time in order to figure that stuff out. So the question is, can we use images where we know what, it, what they'd look like with 32 samples per pixel, and we took the time to actually render them so that they've converged to a, a reasonable approximation of the image? Can we train something so that we can take on the right side of the, Im uh, the image here, we can take a noisy, fast to produce 32 samples per pixel image and create this, a denoised 32 samples per pixel. And you're, right now you're supposed to be nodding your head and smiling and going, whoa, this is cool. So all you did was do 32 samples per pixel, and that was cheap. And then you did something to it, and you made it look this good. And if that something that you did to it was fast, I'm, I'm, I bought into this. I want some of that. This is cool. And now I don't have to do 1,000 samples per pixel. I can only do. 32 and something. And that's where machine learning comes in. Actually, that's where this whole field of image denoising, noisy Monte Carlo rendered images comes in. This is not new. And in fact, there, the, the paper at the very beginning gives you a, a Eurographics 2015 paper called Recent Advances in Adaptive Sampling and Reconstruction for Monte Carlo Rendering. And for the last two and a half decades or so, I think, at least, people have been working on this problem. Um, so how do you take something that's cheap to produce and produce results that are 
almost as good as what you would happen as if you spent a, a huge amount of time that you'd need to get a, a fully converged image. All right, so that's that's the kind of problem that we're trying to solve. Now we're going to go into a lot of things, and we're going to get to this this image, which describes the system that they've put together. But we're going to actually draw that on the whiteboard. I'm scrolling down here because we're going to get down to eventually some more images, and I'll share the screen again where we can start seeing some of the results. But I'm going to stop sharing my image here and switch over the input to this while we talk about this. All right. So now, we on board? We know the kind of problem we're trying to solve? It's not? OK, good, good. OK, and I'm going to lead myself up there so you can watch me in two different ways. Um, and again, there's a ton of previous work on this. This is just one approach to um, the, this problem, which is interesting because they're using machine learning to do this. They're using a data-driven kind of uh, result. And the reason that this is a, a cool paper is because it freaking works, right? They are actually getting great results. But if you go to the end of the paper, there are lots of caveats. There's lots of like, OK, this works here, but notice that this doesn't work, and this is future research. Like one of the things that this paper is doing is only working on static images. A lot of image denoising and rendering takes advantage that one frame is going to look a lot like the next frame. And so there's a lot of temporal stuff going on. In this paper, they're saying, screw that. Matt, we're not going to go there yet. We're just saying, can I denoise a single image so that it looks good? And they don't even say whether if they've tried, or at least I didn't see it in this paper, whether they tried doing a sequence and see how good it looks animated, whether or not you get flickering. You know, that's <laughs> flickering happens. All right, so let's look at this. And we're and by the way, this is going to be convolutional. Hold on, it doesn't look like the word convolutional. Convolutional networks, and we are going to reserve rever, review convolutional networks because every time I have to review convolutional networks for myself. All right, so let's start off with a pen and talk about what we're going to do. First of all, what does an image look like? To begin with, the sample output of a typical Monte Carlo renderer can be arranged in a vector of per pixel data. And you're like, wait, wait, what? So if I've got an image of some fish, fish, eyeballs, and I'm looking at a pixel here. If I can get a little darker pixel here. If I look at a pixel in this image, what do I get there? Well, I'm already right off the bat, there's the color, right? There's a color per pixel, and this is equal to R, G, and B. Pretty straightforward. But in general, when you're looking at denoising Monte Carlo images, you don't just stop at color. That is, you're rendering this stuff, so might as well use as much information as you can possibly get from the renderer. So they also say that this is at this pixel, there is also f, and we're going to put, well, I'm going to be careful about this. These guys are vectors, and I'll, I'll make sure that it's clear what they're vectors. And this can be a list of a whole bunch of information. So I'm going to replace that question mark with a list, let's just call a list, of things like, well, what, would, what could be there? Normal. You could have the normal of the surface there. Uh, maybe the depth. Uh, this, this one is not looking all that good here. Let's go back to the other one. Um, albedo. This, this is actually going to become important. Albedo. And you may be going, well, wait a sec. What's albedo? Let's stop. Because albedo is important to this algorithm. And what is albedo? Albedo is basically the, I always think of albedo because of global warming. Turns out that albedo is basically the reflectance of an object. It isn't the shininess of an object. It's basically how much, if you put in a certain amount of light, how much light comes back out. It's, it's basic, because you can have dark objects and you can have shiny objects, but you, you, know, there's, you can have diffuse objects that are um, uh, uh, 
reflect most of the light coming out of it, even though they're reflecting it diffusely. It's more, if I put in a whole bunch of light, how much light gets actually um, reflected out of that? And the reason I think about it in terms of global warming is because the Earth has an albedo. Depending on the clouds, the cloud layer, clouds are actually have a fairly high albedo. The amount of energy that goes into a cloud that gets bounced back out is fairly high. So if you have a lot of cloud cover, the albedo of the Earth goes up, which means that the amount of energy coming from the sun actually gets reflected back out into space, cooling the planet. So there's this weird, uh, well, not weird, but a very complicated relationship between the temperature of the planet, the amount of clouds that you've got, and the amount of energy that's reflected back out of it. It's super complicated because Venus, for instance, is covered in clouds. And yeah, and so a lot of energy gets reflected out, but Venus is super duper hot. And that's where carbon dioxide comes in, all sorts of interesting stuff. But anyways, albedo is basically the reflectance. How much energy that goes in actually gets reflected out. And this is going to become important. Keep that in mind later on, because they do something to the data with albedo uh, that makes a big difference. Um, and, ooh, ooh, and this is also important. And their variances. And maybe something else, but that. So what's that mean? Well, like I said at the beginning, um, and I'm switching over to the very first paragraph of this, this 2015 paper. Um, they have, so, even simple Monte Carlo rendering algorithms come, for, come with a number of desirable properties. They are consistent, which means that the number of sample as the number of sampled paths increase, the estimated image converges to the correct solution. Some algorithms, and, and well, and then some algorithms like bidirectional path tracing are also unbiased. That is, the expected value of the estimated image corresponds to the correct solution, and the error consists only of variance. And finally, the applicable uh, to most even configurations. Blah, blah, blah. So what's that mean? What's that mean? So remember, we're going to be sending out, we've got our world with our fish in it here. So there's a 3D world with a fish floating around in here, and here's some stuff. And we've got a camera that's floating here. And we're, for a single picture of the image, or pixel on the image plane, we're going to start shooting out rays, right? We're going to shoot out sample rays, and there's bi-directional path tracing, there's going to be light sources, there's going to be all sorts of stuff that we're going to be dealing with. And the value of this pixel here is going to start converging on the expected value, sort of this average. So there's a, there's a blob in the color space of points that are eventually going to average up onto, in, to the color of that pixel. Now, a single light or a single sample into this color space is going to give you this value that's going to be somewhere inside this cluster of pixel or color values that is sort of Gaussian distributed, plus or minus, uh, Gaussian is a little bit of an overshot of hill around the correct value. So the correct value is here, but like the first sample might be way over here. So the question is, as we're watching this thing converge, what does it look like? If we start sending out samples and they're really tightly um, uh, knit around the expected value, then as you send out more samples, it's not going to change much because this Gaussian distribution is very tight. It has a variance that's very small. But this one, because we might see some bright light sources, this might be a shiny thing, there might be a whole bunch of stuff, the Gaussian distribution is very wide. It has a large variance in it. And so the, the colors that are floating around in here can change a lot. Well, that's important. We want to know when we start sending out these samples whether or not we're going to get something that looks like this because we can change how we're going to do our filtering when it's like that or if we're going to get something that looks like that, or we need to make sure that our filter has the right parameters to capture this kind of behavior. Does that make sense? So, and especially think about like a smooth surface versus a rough surface that has a whole bunch of, you know, uh, uh, detail on it. A smooth surface, no matter how you send out samples through this pixel, 
is always going to give you basically the same color coming back, right? Smooth, maybe as long as it's not reflective, it's always going to be there. So the variance of those samples is going to be very small. But a rough surface that might be a little shiny, I send out one sample and I'll get the color of the surface. So I send out another sample and I'll get a reflection of the light that I'm seeing through there. And so the colors are bouncing around in there. They'll still average to the expected value, but I have a huge amount of variance in there. And all these things have variance, depending on how I'm shooting rays out. Okay? So, some of the renderers nowadays can actually tell you what these variances are. And you can imagine how that would be, right? You start sending out some samples and you start watching how they change. How, the, how do the samples change as I'm sending out more and more of these things? And you can compute the amount of change I'm seeing as I send out individual samples. All right. So far, so good. And we've just gotten past our little definition of what we're going to get. All right. So now, the goal. And by the way, in the 2015 paper, there are it, the the paper is split in half. There are two different ways of doing image denoising that they talk about. One is a priori denoising and a posterior denoising. And a priori is using uh, ways of sampling the scene to reduce the the image, and so you actually change the way those samples are being sent out. A posteriori is more of, hey, I'm getting samples back. What can I do to filter this image so that it, I get a smooth result, a, a non-noisy result? This falls into that second category. We don't, we're not modifying how the renderer works. And in fact, they talk about using this technique with multiple renderers to compare and contrast how it works across that. We're not changing how the renderer works at all. We're just saying, if I've got a noisy result, how can I use the results that the renderer gave me to give a smoother or better looking result? All right, so the goal of this, ta -da. well, let's think about this. If I've got a noisy fish image here, and I want to produce a smooth fish image, the very first thing you think about doing is blurring the hell out of the image. I'm going to produce a filter, and I'm going to blur this thing and smooth out the noise. Of course, that, I'm going to take a noisy image and produce a really stunningly blurry image, and it's not going to look good. So a lot of these techniques start saying, well, wait, maybe I can use an intelligent blur. <coughs> so if I've got a, a smooth area of water back here, then I'm going to take a whole bunch of pixels and average them, and I'll get the color of the water. But if I've got a pixel on the edge of the fish here, I don't want to take a big wide swath of this. I don't want to average all that stuff. What I'm going to do is ignore the stuff in the background and maybe use a, a weighted filter here that only uses pit or fish pixels in order to figure out the average of that to get rid of the, the thing. And in fact, a lot of these things, this falls under a thing called bilateral filtering. where bilateral filtering actually tunes the filter, uh, tunes this weighted sum of pixels so that it only uses the good pixels, the pixels that, course, that kind of look like the pixel that you're trying to eventually create. And then a lot of the papers that have come before have come up with some extraordinarily complicated ways of creating these filters on a pixel-by-pixel -pixel basis. All right? So, that's cool. Now that you think about it, you think, all right, well, maybe we could make a tuned filter per pixel. And that's exactly what this paper is trying to do. They're saying, instead of bilateral filtering, can we use machine learning to train something so that when I give it a pixel and its neighborhood, it gives me back a filter that I can use specifically tuned for that pixel because it's seen other images that look like this. That's what this whole paper is about. So now, how do you write that down in math? Well, they have an equation. They say, 
if I've got some parameters. So given a denoising function, uh, let's, let's actually, before I get to this, let's do this whole thing. I'm going to be working on a big capital P. <coughs> this is a block of pixels. And that block of pixels is a, you know, some value that's k by k and big. Uh, they're a little vague at the beginning about what kxp is. Could, is it a, a square block of pixels? Well, it doesn't even have to be, right? It could be actually a, a sort of cloud of pixels around here. They're, they eventually converge on saying, well, this is actually a, a square area around the pixel that you're trying to figure out. Given a block of pixels, we want to create a denoising function called g. And we're going to be make g very vague here as well, because we want to be able to do whatever the hell we want to. It takes in the block of pixels and a set of parameters and produces a denoised pixel. So this is going to spit out C N for a pixel. And C hat is the denoised pixel, and C um, C is this, right? CP is the, the current pixel, the whatever noisy value we've got. They also often assign, say, as an aside, C with a bar across it, P, is the actual result. This is what we want. So that's the value of the rendered pixel if you let it run for 10,000 iteration or, you know, samples per pixel it eventually converges on C bar. So that's the thing we actually want. We don't know that, by the way. We don't want to ever spend that much time computing. So let's get rid of this. We'll come back to that. We want to do this. We want some fancy thing. And this. Ardmin. We've seen Ardmin all over the place. C bar P comma. G X P comma uh, yeah. <clears throat> All right, what does this mean? Well, what we were looking for is a set of parameters for our denoising function. Remember, there's that, and it's a per pixel thing, right? There, this all is all dependent on the local information around here. We're going to look for the best set of parameters. We're going to find the minimum of this that gets our denoising function when working on the area around the pixel we're working on and those parameters closest to the actual result that we want. And it's simple. And the next sentence say, they say is, clearly optimizing this equation is impossible because we don't know that. We don't, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to figure out a good value of this without knowing this. So is there some way we can come up with these parameters for our denoising function that get us close. Now, yes, there are ways of doing this. And uh, they talk about previous work. We're going to skip over that for the recent, uh, the, the value, you know, just time. But it's, there's a good uh, discussion about this kind of stuff on how they currently work. Okay, quick question. So they're just trying to figure out the weights of the various different pixels that they've calculated versus actually calculating the new pixel value from those cycles. Right. So, we're the excellent, excellent question. The whole thing that they're going to be doing, and what a lot of the previous work kind of things do, is to come up with, if I've got a pixel that I, let's actually draw this out. I've got a pixel, P, and I have CP in this pixel. And does it, that's the, the color of a 32 sample per pixel render. So this is a noisy pixel. The question is, can I come up, and let's assume that this is a very small weighted thing, a set of parameters, A, B, C, E, E, F, H, H, I, and I find the set of these parameters for this specific pixel, that when I run this convolutional filter, when I average these guys with these weights, 
with the, the other pixel colors that are around here, the noisy other pixel colors that the renderer produced, I will get a good result for this. I will get a C hat that is really close to the converged value that we, you know, the renderer would produce if you let it run forever. And that's what this is. You know, this is the parameters here that are eventually going to produce this thing. Now they are a little cagey about this. Notice that they are using these parameters inside this big function. So here I've sort of grounded that function as this. This is a functional you know, kernel. But they're saying, wait a sec, these parameters that we're going to be computing are actually going to be a little bit more complicated than that. At the end of it all, we're going to produce a convolutional kernel, but these parameters aren't just A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. No, no, no. These are the parameters that will plop into here that will produce not the actual color, but this convolutional kernel that we then run on the image that produces the color. Now you're going to watch how this happens. <laughs> this, is, this is actually cool. All right. So, but first of all, we're going to do think, three things that are inherent to a supervised learning framework. The function g must be flex, flexible enough, and remember this is function g, it's our denoising function, which is eventually going to turn into a convolutional neural network kind of thing, but that's all. The function g must be flexible enough to capture the complex relationship between the input data, the CPs, and the reference colors for a wide range of scenarios. So remember, this thing that we're doing has to work if it's a fish edge, or a blob of water, or a tail, or some seaweed down here, or whatever. It should be able to handle any place, no matter what image I give it, or part of the image I give you, this thing is going to give us something that works. All right? So which is good, because convolutional neural nets can get quite large, and they can you know, one aspect of the convolutional neural net might work on one part of an image. The other aspect might work on another. That's cool. Now, how do we compare these two things? Well, actually, you don't compare those two things. What we're going to be doing is coming up with some way of deciding whether and well, yes, actually we are. We need to be able to figure out some way of L, C, this is you know, during our neural net training. This is a loss function. And we've said this in, in neural nets before. This is basically how far off we are from what we want. So if I'm going to start training my uh, uh, neural net with actual data where I have let the image render to convergence, how do I tell how far I am across here? Isn't that just comparing the two colors? If you're close, you know, isn't that uh, just a take the RGB vector and do a L2 norm, just figure out the distance between those two things, and then go, oh, that's da, 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 so fast. The choice of a loss function is critical. Ideally, the loss function must capture the perceptually important differences between the estimated and reference color. Estimated versus reference color. However, it mu also must be easy to s evaluate and optimize. And in fact, what they do, instead of using the sum square difference of these colors, you know, if, if I was going to compare two colors, I would take the square root my, um, R reference C minus RG squared plus, you know, green reference C minus G G squared plus data. That's that. No, what they do is they just take this. R C minus R G plus G C minus G G plus the blue one too. And take the absolute value of that. So this is an L1 norm versus an L2 norm. And they talk about why that works later on. So stay, stay tuned for that. Because that, that caught me off guard. It's like, wait, really? Okay. 
In order for our model to be deep, yet avoid overfitting, we've talked about overfitting before in previous talk talks, but we'll talk a little bit about that. We require a large training data set. So we're gonna start running this thing with a whole bunch of noisy images and the eventual nicely rendered images that we spent time actually rendering. Since we require reference images rendered at high sample counts, obtaining a large data set is extremely computationally expensive. But these guys are Pixar and Disney, and so they have images that just spit out of making movies. So they, they um, used a whole bunch of images from uh, um, Finding Dory in order to train this, so, which is cool. All right, so stand back. We're gonna erase most of the stuff except for those things. We'll keep that going. So here's what they do. We're gonna stop and talk first about convolutional neural nets because we need to make sure that they don't, they assume you know this. So remember what a convolutional neural net is. If I want to write a computer program that can detect whether or not there's a cat in this image, more than likely what you're going to be doing is using a convolutional neural net. And a convolutional neural net is like a neural net, but it has this convolutional stage to it. So remember, if in a straightforward neural net, what I do is take the pixels of this image, we'll stretch them out, and then I create that great big interconnected graph. On the convolutional neural net, they say, wait a sec, that is actually too much. We're throwing away spatial information. And then, especially in this kind of situation, man, do you want to use spatial information. So what we're going to do is take this, and the very first thing is connect it up into a layer where we have a five by five, and this can change depending, this is one of the parameters that you can use, filter. And what I'm gonna do is run this filter over this image, and at each time I run this filter over this image, I'm gonna run the filter over the image and then store the results into another image that's slightly smaller, right? Because this is a five by five filter, and we're only going to run it over the parts where it fits. I don't let it go outside of this. So this image is going to scrunch down a little bit. So this five by five filter has a whole bunch of uh, there we go, weights. There's weight i, weight j inside it. And before I do that, I'm also going to add a single um, offset. So I'm going to take each one of these pixels, P, I, and J, multiply it by a weight, and then sum it through that offset. And then I'm going to run it through a function, F, where we've seen these functions before. This is the tan H function, or the sigmoid function, or R, the rectified linear uh, unit function. And this is actually the function that they use. And this function looks like this. It's zero here, and then straight up after that. So a little function like this. All right. So think about what's going on. Taking this pixel, or this filter, and running it there, and creating that pixel. Then we're taking this over here, and we're running it right over here, and creating that pixel. All the while, these weights and that bias don't change. We're doing this over the entire image. And so we're going to be creating a filtered image out of this. Now, what this thing is going to eventually do is be connected up to another set of convolutional filters and another set of this, these kind of weights and biases. And eventually, at the end, you're going to have more images and more images and more images. You're going to come out, and there will be a result at the end. And we're getting a little fuzzy at the end there, but you'll, you'll get that. We're not done. We're not done. Because that would only have one filter per step. So what we're actually going to do is also say, hey, why don't we try this with a different filter? Let's have another 5x5 five five filter that produces another image over here. And we're going to run that through and a whole different set of WIs and WJs and another bias here. And we'll do that again. We'll have another filter and another filter. And so 
running this through here, we're going to produce a whole series of images. And the hope is, is that these filters start picking out relatively interesting bits. Because remember, we're going to be putting this image in, and at the end we're going to say, is there a cat in this image? And so we're going to start creating, or the convolutional network is going to start creating filters that are going to look for various cat bits. One filter will be tuned to finding areas that go are sharply up like cat ears, and one filter might be tuned to finding cat noses. And because we don't know exactly where the nose is, it's going to fall in this image. We're going to run that filter over the entire image. We're just going to use that cat nose filter to check every section of this thing and say, is there anywhere in here that we see a cat nose? And is there anywhere in here that we see a cat ear? And so we're going to have a whole bunch of these guys. How many? I don't know. We're going to we'll try to decide what that, how many we're going to count. And then after that, we're going to do it over again. We have another filter producing a smaller image and another filter. But now look what it's fil filtering on. It's not actually filtering on the image. It's filtering on whether or not we saw a cat nose and whether or not we saw a cat ear. And this might be saying, well, if I see a cat nose, is it nearby a cat eye? Well, what that means is I'm going to actually take this guy and this guy, which might be a cat ear and a cat eye, and see if I can filter those together. So these filters actually get to see all these images that are produced. So when I run this filter, it's actually a filter that covers an area of this, and that same area of this and same over of this, it's actually a four-dimensional filter, or a three-dimensional filter, sorry. And that, that produces an image. And so what it's basically doing is looking for a cat ear and a cat eye that might be somewhere in this image. And then we do it again. And so eventually you're looking for the various bits and pieces of catness. And each layer, because you're looking at a, a reduced representation of this image, is searching for more and more complicated bits and pieces. And if you look at these filters, they start off looking just sort of like edge filters. We're trying to look for you know, various um, features. But as you start looking at the images and you get farther and farther down the chain, you're starting to look at the filters actually are looking for more and more cat-like images because they're, well, if you, there's ways of visualizing these things. And that's what they're, they're uh, solving for. Now, this is still just a neural net where, remember, we put this image in, we run it through there, and we have all these weights and stuff that are initialized to basically random stuff. And then we have a result at the end, and we look to see, is this thing correct or not? If it isn't correct, we figure out how to change the Ws and the Bs throughout this entire thing and do it again. So we're going to wash back and forth through this back propagation through convolutional neurals and the neural network. And eventually, we're going to find these Ws and Bs for the entire thing. Wow. OK, that's pretty cool. This is, this is a really cool feature. And of course, this is just a pure convolutional neural net. You can also put in more standard, fully connected neural networks in here. You can build these things in all sorts of different ways. Does this make generic sense? You know, sort of get you back, back up to speed? Because now, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to take this thing, take our image. It's time to 15 minutes. Good, 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 good. All right. So, what we're going to do. First of all, do two things. We're going to take our, let's build this thing up. Here is our renderer. Renderer. Ah, I can't write it all. This produces a noisy image. Actually, the renderer, like I said, produces a lot of stuff. And so we're actually going to break this noisy image into two parts. There is a uh, noisy diffuse components. Noisy diffuse components. And we'll do components like they did in the image. So there's an R channel, a G channel, a B channel, a 
variance, a whole bunch of channels in a noisy diffuse image. And then you can imagine what's coming in here. There's going to be a noisy specular image. And the reason we do this is because they're different. The noise properties of diffuse color and specular color are way different, as you would imagine. Specular has a very different noise characteristics than diffuse. Okay. Now we're going to do some stuff to this. We're going to process our data. We'll come back to this, and we're going to process this data. It's going to be processed differently. But then this is going to go into our convolutional neural net, CNN. And this is going to have a whole bunch of layers. There's going to be filters that are going to produce more images, followed by more filters, followed by more images, so eventually, something spits out. Question mark. And we're going to do exactly the same thing, although I'm not going to draw that whole thing. So there's another convolutional neural net. And then, yeah, this is darker. Something spits out. OK? And then, this something is going to be used on the original images so we're going to um, eventually use this to create a, a final image. So we're going to take this and take this and do a big plus sign on it and produce an image that hopefully we can compare to the right result. And the cool thing is they did this in TensorFlow, right? So all this stuff that's being done in TensorFlow is in the TensorFlow framework. And the way you train it is you give it a noisy image. It does all this stuff. Do, 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 do. You compare it with the actual rendered image. And then TensorFlow knows how to do the back propagation to change the parameters in this whole thing. And we do it again. We train it with a bunch and a bunch and a bunch of images. Now, some of the details. All right. Uh, first of all, is convolutional neural net? Purely convolutional. There's no fully connected layers. Uh, we'll leave that to the authors to talk about why that happens. Um, so each layer of the convolutional neural net has this function f of the layer that we're at times w, which is our weights of our convolutional filter, wl, times zl minus 1 which is the input from the previous output, plus the offset beta L. And there's our uh, rectified linear unit thing that is going to give us the nonlinear behavior of this thing. All right. So we do this. The very first input is x sub p. Remember that block of pixels? So one of the things that uh, you made that I thought was originally happening, this is not doing this on the entire image. What you're doing is taking this noisy image and taking a chunk of it, which makes it actually easier for this thing to be trained on. So x sub p is a blob of the or is a, a square of this image, and we can actually use a single image to produce a whole bunch of uh, training data by taking different areas of this image and sending it through and coming back. So. A single image can produce a ton of training data. And then we move on to the next image, do the same thing for and each time we go through, we're only looking at this smaller image. And this image tends to be the, they, they were saying that it's um, you know, just training, training, training was how big are these images? Um, eight hidden layers. Or, Oh, 65 by 65. So 65 pixels by 65 pixels uh, for their images, which are um, uh, 1920 by 1080 frame. Okay. So 65 by, and this would, uh, I would imagine, would be resolution dependent. Right. So far, so good. Uh, yes. And. Question mark. What's that? What comes out of there? 
And in fact, Darren asked this question. They actually experimented with two different things. One was direct color prediction. We want, after you do through this whole thing, we want to actually know the RGB color of the diffuse pixel. And in fact, I talked about this before. I was like, well, this thing is my V noiser. I, I handed the blob, so this whole thing is G, by the way. I handed the blob of pixels around the pixel that I'm wanting to work on. It's going to compute the, you know, the, the, the parameters for this thing. And then it's, this thing is eventually going to produce the, the denoised color. Well, I talked about it producing a kernel rather than a denoised color. And the very first thing that they started playing with was, well, screw the kernel. Let's, let's assume that this thing stands in for that filter kernel. Why not just have it produce the direct color? And they say, yes, we tried this first. This actually works. Direct prediction achieves good results. However, we found that the unconstrained nature and complexity of the problem makes optimization difficult. So this is actually a little bit harder to solve for than what they call the kernel predicting. And this is a little bit of a spoiler alert, because that's in the title. Kernel predicting convolutional neural net. So they looked at this and they said, no, this doesn't work as well. It doesn't converge as well. This is the way to go. Same thing here. We're going to produce a kernel that we're going to use to figure out the, the smooth color. So this is producing that tuned kernel on a per pixel basis. All right. So far, so good. So they eventually do a little bit of math. There's a couple of other things, but there's a couple of things that I wanted to talk a little bit about this. This kernel turns out to be just a kernel. Uh, and the result that they're using, they're getting a kernel that is, well, a K by K kernel. So it's a K by K matrix that's set there. And that is set at the very beginning. So the same kernel size comes out no matter what pixel you're looking at. You may be thinking, well, is that good enough? Is that good enough? Well, actually, this is pretty big. This is a 21 by 21 size kernel. It's a fairly large kernel. And you're thinking, well, gee whiz, what, if I have a 21 by 21 kernel and I've got something that has a sharp edge, maybe I don't want that much. That's okay, because this convolutional neural net, both the diffuse and the specular one, are going to be filling in the values for you here. And they're going to be producing these values so that that thing is tuned to average out just the right number of pixels within the 21 by 21 box. So if I have a fish with some seaweed, and I'm trying to figure out this pixel, I've got a big kernel around here, right? All these guys are going to be zero. Because we don't want to use those guys to figure out the pixels um, uh, the fish pixels call it. That's what this thing will eventually do. Fingers crossed. Makes sense. This thing is also normalized, uh, just to give it a better properties, but we'll talk about that. Got five more minutes. This works, by the way. This actually produces great results, and we'll uh, hopefully just have a section to go through. There is one thing. This question mark. There's some diffuse property processing. Now, I love this bit because one of the problems with doing this is that you want, in my experience with using any kind of machine learning, this stuff inside here starts to fade away. You use TensorFlow to set it up and it's great. You know, and you decide on how big the filters are and how many layers you have and all sorts of stuff. It's this stuff, what data you feed into this. And so they started thinking about, well, wait a second. I've got two different pieces of information that I'm sending into two separate uh, convolutional neural nets. I've got a, a noisy diffuse image. Remember that albedo thing? What if I've got a dark part of my image compared to a light part of my image? If I try to make this thing super, try to figure out everything, it's going to take a long time to converge, and I'm going to need a large neural net to basically capture everything that could possibly be. 
what if we could normalize the input and basically figure out how to make this thing behave better so that it works on any kind of image? And the, the very first thing that they tried is saying, hold on, let's take our color that's a diffuse color and divide it by the albedo of the image or the, the object that uh, it's landed on, plus some sort of epsilon. There's a little epsilon that they do to make sure that you don't get a divide by zero. Is normalizing in this color. If you've got a, a bright, um, in, uh, uh, an object in your scene that's very bright, it returns a lot of light when it's uh, shining on, then the albedo is going to be higher and it's going to bring this, this color down. Likewise, if you've got a piece of velvet that has a very low albedo, then that low albedo is going to divide by this and it's going to bring that color up. It's basically a way of normalizing based on the, the properties of the surface. Very clever. And all of a sudden, this thing now becomes less of what the object is and more of what the object looks like, right? The, the, the details of the object. Does it have edges? Does it have roughness? That kind of stuff. That's the stuff you can't normalize against. But how bright the object is, no, you can't. And likewise, we did something cool with the, the specular. Specular is crazy. These are all high dynamic range images. And one of the problems with uh, neural nets is if you have results, if you've got a result where you have a whole bunch of data and then you have a spike and then more data, your neural net, these kind of things can throw neural nets off like crazy. And they're just like, no, we throw them, they're crazy kind of stuff. They said, let's take our color specular and do a log on it. So we'll do log color specular plus one, which scrunches these things down. We're going to basically take this, preserve all the details, but those things now become much less of a bump. That, that means that the results of this are going to have to be unlogified, right? We've got a log that's been built into this that needs to be done there, and this has to be unalbedoed at the end. There's a little bit of a whoop at the end where you have to take out the albedo. But this is something that they said if you don't do, and they have examples of this in the, the paper, you get much, much crappier results. This thing reduces specular artifacts like nobody's business. And by the way, they said, we've noticed that if you do this on previous work, it actually works better. So you should, you should log your spec all the time. All right. And that's it. This is it. So at the end of this, think about what we've got. We have little patches from noisy images that we've rendered, and they use, they use a bunch of images from Finding Dory. Train the living crap out of them. So you're sending this over and over again. Make sure that the diffuse is normalized. The specular is also normalized in a log sense. Train two separate neural nets, because the noise properties of both of these are there. Undo the specular in the, in the log in the albedo. And then at the end of this, you've got kernels that you can use to uh, filter your image. And then you pass that back. And over and over again, eventually, this whole thing, this whole process that goes from here to there, this is the G of XP, remember this thing, theta. And theta are all these weights, all the weights and the biases throughout here, all these things that got created, those are the parameters for this. Now, we have zero minutes left, but let's quickly share a screen and you can start seeing. Screen share, in case you didn't see this. Uh, Mendeley, there we go. Um, so this, let's zoom in a little bit more so you can see the results. So what do we got? This is just a small, remember XP? Uh, you know, the, uh, this is a big image. And the area that we're looking at, this is, this is not the area, this is not an XP, but this is just a small section of this so you can see it. So this is the 32 point, uh, samples per pixel image. Oh, and it's hard to see on this thing, but uh, yeah, feel free to walk up. And they're comparing it with other results. These 
RDFC, APR, N4, LBRF are all previous work. And then they get to this one, and this is the reference. This is 1,000 to 4,000 samples per pixel. So considerably longer than 32 samples per pixel. And the thing is, first of all, some of these guys are pretty impressive. Uh, in fact, N4 is not bad. N4 can actually do some pretty decent work. But in just about every example that these guys are doing, and I'll zoom in a little bit more so we can compare against N4. Uh, it's as far as I can zoom with this. You can see that their result versus the reference result does not suck all that much. <laughs> Here's some more stuff. Look at their result is the second from the right. Uh, this is the reference. And here's a glass of milk. And here's N4 not behaving very well at all. And you can imagine with specular, specular is the trickier one. This one actually looks really good. This one's, oh no, N4 actually does look good. It's the LBF. Um, and I leave that as an exercise to the reader about that. But their result is super good. And remember, it's fun to look at what they're starting out with, right? This is the 32 by 32, or 32 samples per pixel thing. So it's really noisy. This one, even better. Look at this. N4 still has some ringing. You can see some ringing around this area right there. You can see a little shadow of this. Theirs has a little bit too, but it's much more pleasant ringing. And this, notice the results. There's a little bit of motion blur there. And then um, it's fun to go down to the very bottom here. We're going to skip all the way. Well, this one's interesting. So um, this is what you get with just a straight convolutional neural network. This is their version. So if you don't do all that log and uh, albedo normalization, you get this kind of result. This is theirs, and this is the reference. Notice that the reference, you can kind of see there is one pixel here with a white hot spot. And the reference actually says, hey, that white spot hot spot is important. There just doesn't even find it. Uh, but no, uh, none of them do. Um, here's one with, if you don't separate the diffuse and the specular, you'll see that, and, and add all the features in there, you'll over blur. But once you add these features, the variants and stuff like that, it can start adapting based on this. So this is the reference. You can see that there's features up here that get really nicely captured. And then without the log, check this out. There's all sorts of crap that you get without the log because of the specular problem. And with the log, it just goes right away. And man, the results are really good. And remember, you're getting some really crappy noise. And then finally, they at the very end, they say, we're not done. Here, in this image, we're getting kicked. I'm going to ignore this, and then we'll be finished. In this image, this is a video screen. And so these stripes are actual data. But because they trained it with Finding Dory and they're running it on Cars 3 images, give us one minute. Um, the, there was no, this looks like noise to it. And so theirs smooths the crap out of the noise. Well, the reference says, no, these should be video stream uh, pixel things. And also, they never got trained on fire. And they said the, the fire got smoothed out. And um, We'll skip over this one. This one impressed the heck out of me. Here's the input. This is what N4 and theirs creates. <laughs> Holy smokes. All right, we're done. Bye bye. <laughs>